Um, hello, uh, I am, we'll tell you on the next slide who I am, but uh, that's me. Uh, this is Scala War Stories. Um, the slide there kind of understates the case. I've worked five years on Scala C, but it feels like 50. Um, it's, uh, the, let's see here, we need to see this one. This one, that, that bonfire burning there from uh, 09 to 13 is like, that's, that's the life into, you know, I bored, poured my life into that and it kept it burning. That's <laughs> and now it's simmering down. So uh, I, I'm actually not here representing TypeSafe. In fact, I'm never representing TypeSafe, even at the best of times. Nobody lets me speak for them. Um, <laughs> wisely, I am not good at speaking for anyone, even myself. Um, but I'm especially not speaking for TypeSafe today because I have given my notice at TypeSafe and I will be doing something else, which I'm not entirely sure what. Uh, but uh, I'm still sort of uh, associated with TypeSafe. In any case, the important thing is I don't speak for TypeSafe. Uh, I don't get out much. That's, that's really understating the case. Uh, I don't like anything that takes time away from code. Uh, but I always come to this conference because it's great. <laughs> so uh, many thanks to Brian and to Penny. If I'd uh, been faster updating my slides or realized I was going to actually use my laptop, I would have gotten you in there. Um, but uh, so right now it just says uh, Brian. And uh, but thanks to everybody who I've. There's a number of us who've been to all six of these, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, no, nobody that I loathe or anything, which is nice. So it's fun seeing everybody every year. And, talking about the amazing advances in tail calls. It's like we have the same conversations every year, too. And at the very first one, yeah, tail calls. Let's all agree, tail calls. We walk out of here nodding our heads. We walk back the next year still nodding. <laughs> I mean it when I say I worked like a dog on these slides. So I'm, I'm sorry to you know, try to like lower your expectations like this. It's just I really wanted this to be a really good talk and it, it is uh, but of course I'm always dissatisfied with everything ask anyone who works with me um, so you know maybe it's great but uh, I wouldn't know because everything looks bad to me all I can see are bugs like for me it's just you know dead bodies everywhere all the time uh, <laughs> and so I put a lot of time into this but most of it didn't actually make it to the screen uh, because I kept hitting dead ends where the gist of the war story would be we're doing it wrong look how badly we can do this um, so I, I really was trying to get stories that involved, you know, sort of in, inherent difficulties, stuff that uh, generalized a little bit beyond just like not programming well. So, uh, so I had to discard a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm, and I'm only half kidding about dinner. I mean, genuinely, if you don't like this, and you can find me tonight, I'll buy you dinner. Oh, there, I did get one last minute injection when um, our, our business guy got the, uh, the Red Monk reference. That's Red Monk from... June of 13, uh, just from, from just now. And you can see us there, uh, Scala, leading the, the pack of also rands, uh, chasing down Pearl and friends. Um, but I mean, that's kind of amazing to me, really. Uh, I, it, yeah, words fail me sometimes. It's like, how does anything work, is, is the question I ask myself every day. Because you look at stuff, there's so many bugs, and yet, you look at anything else and it's just as bad. Does anybody else feel like, you know, we're just not very good at this, like as a profession? I feel like that all the time. I, I don't know how alone I am, but I really, it's like shake, I wake up shaking my head, I go to bed shaking my head. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't believe in, in labeling axes. <laughs> There's an upward trend of some kind. Scala is on it. What else do you need to know? <laughs> um, I, you know what, I didn't even look. I just thought it was a nice, it looks like a little speed racer thing and, and scholars. I, I know that it's good news that you got all these guys in the nest and, and, and that I was able to just shut closure out of the uh, graph here by, with my selective snipping so that we looked, <laughs> so that we looked like the class of the field. Um, and oh, and let me also point out that as part of my like, this talk isn't any good thing, please feel free to like ask questions and stuff because I'm actually better off trying to think on my feet uh, than I am working with anything I've prepared. <laughs> uh, right, we already saw that. Um, 
the failure of credentials, the discrediting credentials. Um, I feel like I need to say this with this audience because I know how, uh, let's just say, inadequate uh, our sophistication is in terms of code generation compared to some of the other code bases people are responsible for in here. So uh, I, I hate to look like I'm standing here saying, and this is the best anyone can do, and people are laughing. You know, that's uh, clearly not the case. Um, we, however, have a special set of challenges that I think are not shared by everybody. And it is truly a voracious consumer, the compiler, the rest of it. And it's hard, actually, to get down through all the other problems down to the bottom where you can really uh, think about bytecode in great detail. So a lot of it is old and has been creeping along. But thanks to uh, the guys with the little at signs uh, who are in this room, of course, because uh, that's I'm just trying to keep them from killing me. Uh, <laughs> we are definitely getting better, uh, which is Nice. So some of this, some of what you'll see here today is like Scala 2.7 stuff from three, four years ago, but plenty of it's still applicable. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of war stories out there, right? I mean, uh, friendly fire is a big part of life uh, as a programmer, and uh, you know, you're always trying to like rebuild the base because the walls are falling down, but those guys are gone, etc. And you know, all of this might sound like cavalry charging machine gun nests to you guys, uh, I, but I'm again, I'm attempting to distill things down to the uh, the interesting stuff with some legitimate fundamental aspect. Uh, various luminaries are going to turn up uh, here I, I, as a little game. If you know who any of these faces are, uh, based on or based on the quote or the picture, please feel free to say it. I'll be impressed on some of them. Um, but three quarters of the things on which all code is based are lying in a fog of uncertainty to a greater or lesser extent. Um, truer words never spoken. They weren't spoken about code in the first place, but again, never truer. We work with shackles, right? It's the, we, it's a, there's a straitjacket on us all the time about what we can do. Um, in particular, one of the, like half the things that look crazy are all trying to preserve separate compilation. Um, the JVM really does not uh, make it easy. And, uh, you know, personally at this point, uh, it's the things I've seen, uh, it's, uh, I think it's time to punt on at least a subset of it and, you know, to take a less, a less ambitious view and say, well, you know, we have a certain level of separate compilation. But for now, we have total separate compilation, which means everything's got to somehow get packed into that interface trait, whatever. You'll see a nice example of what happens and how painful it is. Um, Java interop is one of those moving targets. Who, uh, you know, it's like Scala is kind of celebrated for its Java interop, but when you get to the corners, um, it, it's, the pain starts hitting fast and furious. And it's really difficult because the, the, the impedance mismatch in the last mile is, is off the charts. Um, our bug database can uh, inform you in grand detail uh, about where these challenges arise. But uh, Java interop is just a very fuzzy thing. However, in general, it's like we have to preserve Java interop for some fuzzy definition of that, which means there's stuff we can't do because it would, you know, break Java. And then there's the, 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 the answer to everything, and then the answer to nothing is like, well, if we could just spin up some bytecode at runtime. Yeah, well, if we could, that would solve a lot of problems. And I guess we would have a bunch of new ones. I don't know, uh, I'm, you guys, Jay Ruby is like, that's your life, right? I mean, you guys do that all the time, right? Oh, yeah. And do you feel like that's like, should we be embracing that? Or you know, are we just gonna trade for a different world of pain? We're not running into any issues with it. Really? So uh, it's interesting, that might just be a whole new path. Uh, but for the time being, and historically, that has been a, a constraint that was not particularly negotiable, and so again, a lot of this falls out of that. And then now, we get the completely at odds with the rest of it, like binary compatibility. Well, it's the intersection of separate compilation and binary compatibility when you're trying to bring new capabilities to the platform is just death, it's just three-way car crash. Um, it cannot be done, it's just a matter of how much it's going to hurt. So a lot of life for me and, and my uh, uh, collaborators is 
We've got this high-level language that's been designed uh, not in ignorance of the JVM, but not always with like, well, let's figure out, like, let's build up from what the JVM does and make life easy on the poor implementer. It's more like, well, how would things be if they were really cool? And it's like, well, okay, that's a completely impossible. We won't do that. That just sounds hard. We'll leave that for somebody to implement. And so that's, you know, that's me, and we have to implement. And it can be quite uh, uh, hazardous to your, your sanity. Um, a, a particularly glaring example is access. Uh, the platform offers us public, package, protected, and private. But Scala got very ambitious in this area and dreamed up a bunch of new stuff. And uh, well, we will have examples of what happened with that uh, as well. And then performance becomes such a nightmare. It's like if I could go back in time, it's the one thing you, you must do from no matter how high level you wish to be is be very conscious of what the performance profile of you know, what it's going to take, what that's going to look like. Because if you have inherently designed in things that demand you know, these like scaffolding everywhere to keep, it, keep the semantics right, you can't, you know, there's just no way to wish your way out of that without some real magic on the part of the JVM. So I, I want to do what you did with like the little language Mira, right, where it's just like sort of just, just on top of it. It just seems like you could get a lot of, like 98% of the goodness in both directions. Uh, by you know just just completely focusing on like how is this map exactly to bytecode? Now let me just make a nice little high-level language just on top of that. Somebody's got to know who that is. <coughs> Come on, guys, you're disappointing me. <coughs> Good. It's Trotsky, that's it. And, and by the way, that quote is misattributed, but it's, it's such a good quote, I can't help it. <laughs> so what, what makes Scala Scala? Well, uh, a lot of it is like, here's some annoying irregularities in Java. Let's make them regular. So there's too many namespaces. You have to treat a field differently from a method. Uh, and then you change it, and now you've got to rewrite all the call sites because they don't have parentheses, or they do. Um, primitives are all, you know, every single thing you do involving a primitive type is going to have its own little special guy running around. And you want to change, you know, you're in boilerplate central trying to manage all this stuff. Same with arrays, all this. Uh, not to mention uh, the non-uniformity of the nine, or is it eight, primitives, right? Because Java doesn't treat void as like a first-class type. It's just a thing that can appear in return position, but it's not a real type. So Scala says, let's just have one way of looking at things, which is great, right up until you need to see the difference. And then it is not. Unification is always a double-edged sword because you're taking a distinction and making it go away. It, now it has to be invisible. It has to be completely invisible. If it is accidentally visible or intentionally visible on somebody's part, then you broke them somehow, and probably in some like really annoying way because you've gone out of your way to make it hard to see through. So by, by getting the 98% spot, you, now all your goodness turns into badness as you've stopped them from seeing what's really happening. So, and there are many examples of this. So I think it's a good design principle. If you, first of all, you'll always fail to completely cover it. So everything uh, along these lines where you're trying to unify things has to have a, a way to open that box, a clean, controlled, you know, well-understood path. Uh, and then, you know, then we can deal with these things sensibly instead of just these horrible reflection hacks and you know, just trying to like guess, you know, we're bouncing particles off things nearby, seeing what comes back. Okay, I can tell that was a primitive. I mean, all these indirections because we're trying to hide it. It'd be better if we didn't hide it so much. Here's a, a classic in the world of what happens when you unify. So as you may know, NAN is not equal to NAN if it's like the real NAN, but because they noticed that you could never get uh, something back out of a map if it had NAN as a key, they said, OK, we'll make the object NANs equal, but the, but the primitive NANs are unequal. Well, we only have one thing. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> but 
That, that's supposed to feel like trapped. <laughs> there really is nowhere to go with this. There are many examples of this, and there's just no good solution for us. Uh, you know, you just pick some sort of, you do the best you can, you pick something, but it isn't the right thing all the time. And there's no good way to offer the right thing in the times when it's not the right thing, because there's only one thing. I'm sorry? <laughs> I do think that's bad. I do think that will be worse. <laughs> oh, of these. Uh, Um, and sort of in my head, I do. Uh, I don't, I, I, if I thought that, that it would go to some good use, I'm sure I could make it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure you're intimately familiar with the real burn, which is that one is not equal to one. Right, yeah, and well, here, we're gonna, we're gonna do some more on, on this subject, I think, momentarily, so. Oh, but first, we will look at nesting. Now, uh, this one's a, a bit of an ironic failure, so, because Scala brings a bunch of new access levels. You've got, and as I mentioned before, you've got four access levels in Java, but we throw in private this and protected this, both of which limit access to the in this instance. So you are private from other, even the same class. If it's a different one, it can't reach in and look at your private this things. And then furthermore, the qualifier, if it's not this, can be any enclosing identifier, which could be a class, an object, or a package. And then you would limit yourself to that scope. So private foo here in package foo looks actually like it's the same as what the default level is in Java, which is uh, limited to the package that I'm in, right? It's like, so that's the sort of implicit uh, level of any unlabeled Java method. And that's as to the extent that it's possible to even say that, they are the same, but they're not the same because everything nests in Scala. And so you run into stuff like this. And that's an actual example from Scala 2.7. Uh, you have to know what language uh, this was expressed in because package foo.bar is has no relationship to package foo in java but in scala it's within it and so the access is allowed uh, so there's these sort of like these breakdowns in like what what it means to nest is uh, uh, not something you know you're necessarily obvious going in but it's sure obvious in hindsight <laughs> because uh, it shows up in a bunch of different contexts. Basically, and in Java, people are used to, you compile some code and you wrote you know, an access level, you're probably gonna find that access level in the code, right? I mean, it's like there's an actual sort of a mapping. In Scala, there's not even an attempt, it's, it's way, it's impossible, like by a long ways, because the, attempt, the granularity it's trying to bring to the game is just too high, so everything's public in the bytecode, right? And the enforcement is all done by the Scala compiler. Um, but again, this becomes a big problem because of binary compatibility. If everything's public, then every single thing that you do, it would, no matter how private, is suddenly part of your API. That's not cool. <laughs> Who's that? Churchill. Churchill. That's right. Never, never, never believe any feature will be smooth and easy but that anyone who embarks on the strange voyage can measure the tides and hurricanes he will encounter. So Java's very upfront about it. There's reference types and there's primitive types. And you know, maybe they can like send love letters to each other across a great distance, but they're certainly not part of the same team. Um, we put them all on the same team. They're all any. Uh, so you get these interesting sort of subtle manifestations of this difference. Because in Java, the only way to say, like, this thing is whatever you want it to be is object. <laughs> now, when I wrote that, did I mean I want objects specifically, or is that just the best I could do to say any? All right? Because there's no word for any. There's only object. So uh, here we are reading Java bytecode from Scala and have to sort of like layer an interpretation on that. Um, and so there are various breakdowns that arise from this. Uh, let's see. 
for instance, and this syntax here, because we did arrays not covariant, because they're not, uh, so since arrays are not covariant, if you want an array that acts like the covariant array of Java, you write it like this, which means this is an array of some reference type that could be any subtype of any ref, whereas array any ref means it must be specifically an array any ref, which is object. Um, so here we have, you know, x1, in bytecode, we're, we can successfully say, although we're going to see that we're wrong about that on a different one, uh, we can say that this is safely an array of a reference type, and so we can erase to an actual array of any ref, which for, at the JVM level is whatever it turns out to be, that's okay, right? Because it's, it's cool with covariant arrays. Um, but this could be any array, including like an integer array. So that's got to be uh, object itself, not array object, because the only common supertype of the various arrays is object. So that's the, the only, but the only distinction here is any versus any ref, which is not even an existing distinction in Java. So you can see the opportunity here for uh, distress. Uh, <coughs> you have also other supertypes in common, serializable and other stuff. Uh, yeah, but do you have do you have serializable? Is that I can't remember. There's, is that true? Do all the array types have serializable as a parent? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have that. I'm not sure like what good that's going to do you, but yes, you do have serializable. That's nice. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're but you're you're right to pay attention to this. Uh, so that's going to arise in another context, again, I think momentarily. Serializable is, a, is quite a favorite of mine. Oh, but let's... <laughs> well, serializable is funny because Scala works so hard to give you these nice lubs, like, you know, you do a list of three unrelated things. Quite often, what it's going to dream up in there is serializable, right? Um, it's, especially because case classes automatically mix serializable in. So you, you were trying to do some, like, interesting thing, but you accidentally threw in, you know, I don't know, an integer. Right? Oh, good, it's serializable, so that's what, that's what it dreams up. It's a list of serializable. So here, here's bottom types are a true nightmare on JVM. Um, they're really useful. They're one of the things about Scala I like the best in terms of having like a consistent type model. Uh, but in order to implement them sanely and correctly, there has to be a way for something to be a subtype of everything, which is clearly not going to fly. So instead, we have these like fake not things, and we've just got to avoid walking into the wall like we do here. Um, that looks to the naive eye like a thing that can safely be, right, string is final. <laughs> What's it going to be? It's, of course, it's an array of string, except that there, you can call that method with an array of nothing. Uh, and the array of nothing, the actual manifestation at the JVM level is not an array of string because it can't be an array of string and the billion other things it might need to be. So it says, not cool, that's not that, you lose. And so you know, these things all have to be anticipated. Um, and like, you can write every method in the world with like a bridge from, uh, you know, and then pass, throw objects at it and you know, work this stuff out at runtime. But you, the number of artifacts and the, the poor execution we have on actually executing those artifacts correctly. But the amount of like artifact management, you know, bridge methods and related is really off the charts. I mean, if there was one thing, simplify life to me, it would be to give some of that back to you guys. Um, I, I, hope, <laughs> I hope you're interested. I'll send you a present. <laughs> ah, so example, um, that's one method. <laughs> That's one method in list. It is, uh, it is refined throughout various uh, supertypes, uh -huh, traits. Um, and so you, in, in the end, when everything gets bundled, uh, you've got all the, all the abstract versions that, in the interfaces that go with the traits. And then you've got all the covariantly refined versions that come from the implementations. And when all is said and done, there's one seek to call and 34 uh, Th some 34 uh, buddies in there, and like that's the extreme example, but this is everywhere. I mean, like, you know, there's just, it's a lot of methods. So this means that if anybody wants to declare a method like any of in this list, you basically is allowed to do that, right? You cannot have a concrete method that looks like a bridge. Uh, well, if you had a concrete method 
uh, that, was, that matched up with one of these, when you tried to actually mix them together into a class, it would complain and say that you need to add another override, which disambiguates which it is that you mean. Um, but most of these are, are traits extending traits, and so the relationship is established statically, and then in the end, you tie it all together in a nice bow. So just in case you thought that, that last example of failure uh, was something specific to bottom types, uh, actually the, the, the scene is much worse because Scala's type system is so rich. Uh, and the type system is far richer in terms of what it can express than the implementation is in terms of what it expects you to express. So they're all over the place. You can crash all kinds of stuff with types like int with string. Now there's nothing wrong with a type like int with string. Um, it's uninhabited, uh, but uh, that it's still a type. Now that's no problem as long as you don't have things which are taking uninhabited types and then turning them into real things which will be inspected. And uh-oh, that's what arrays do. You don't need a value of int with string to make an array of int with string. You can just make an empty one. And that's death. Like that, all that's, So there's a huge like, swaths of prohibitions related to arrays that we don't do that we should. Um, but for now, you just get these good examples of oops. Yes, yes, exactly. I, exactly. I just wanted to make the point that it has, you don't need bottom types at all. You just need any sort of more interesting type than, you know, classes. So all of these uninhabited boots, you could not say the punt that you knew represented them as a null and never a null land again in array context. You could say, ah, it's a zero length array. Um, type it needs to be. Well, the difficulty is that uh, to create this is propagating this type. Um, and which may be used in further co type computations after this, who, which could be anything, right? This might be a lower bound of something which is actually relying on the fact that it, it's lower bounded by int with string, and then that will make its way back out again as either an int or a string. It's like, uh, like negative one and, uh, and uh, e to the i pi plus one equals zero, right? Like when you do an electrical uh, engineering analysis, you go through the imaginary numbers and back to real. Um, so you can go, you know, you can traverse these uninhabited types and come back to inhabited. There are no shortcuts here. I've tried them all. <laughs> um, if uh, you, you can't have stuff like this, you can't have a thing that is like taking an uninhabited type and making it like reality and then expect things to continue uh, from that point forward. Like there has to be insulation from the uninhabited. Uh, there's probably some good expression about that. Maybe Adrian would like to comment. <laughs> he looks like, no. Yes, James? Right, 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 right. This is not this is not the usual like complaint about arrays, right? Like this is not the exactly the irregular complaint. It is the failure to erase when everything else does, um, and yeah, and so that's just propagating information in a way that's very dangerous to you if you depend on your types. So this, this is the unwinnable war right here. Um, either we represent our types correctly and fail. Several examples there, there are many more, really. This is, just, <laughs> this is such a sampling. Um, or we don't, and then you try to get at stuff from Java, and oh, you know, that's an object, right? Like, if you, basically, if we, put, if we squash it as far as we need to squash it so that we will not encounter some kind of, like, you know, class cast exception or no such method error, then a lot of the time it's just going to be object, and now you can't use it. Uh, so we need, like, some kind of, because we've, the descriptor and the signature, what else do we have? You know, so we, uh, we're, because the whole idea here is that Java doesn't need to be Scala, right? It's like, in principle, you could just use stuff, but you can't. Um, so it's just... I don't know. I don't know what the answer to this is. Uh, maybe a, some, some sort of like richer uh, infrastructure in which, because it is, it's the linkage uh, at the JVM level of this like, of, of descriptors and signatures and these very specific demands upon them. Uh, and, uh, then what that, and then what that implies about the type model. And so it's like, if you want to like bring more to the game here, you better be careful what the more is, right? It's, or you're in big trouble. <laughs> uh, so you would, I mean, you, you, you seem to be in the position where 
you have to take your type information and throw it down a rabbit hole where someone may or may not ask an awkward question and you don't know. Uh, true. Uh, so what is it, what what are you implying with uh, the, the observation? Well, awkward, I mean, you, it would be lovely if you could figure out how to make that fear of true or something to go away. Well, it doesn't it doesn't sound true to me that that, uh, that awkwardness is going to correlate sufficiently strongly with statically an analyzable. Oh, I mean, for us. I, I I I think I think you could design a type system around that property, and I think this is that is not ours. That's my that's my guess. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that would be very interesting to design a language around, like with it in mind at the beginning. Uh, sadly, few of us are in that position. Um, post post facto theorem. <laughs> You can. Uh, so there are two issues with that. One is that, that well, it's always the implementation. Like, which uh, it, that sounds great in principle. Now go try to modify the Scala compiler to change something about the naming. Um, good luck. And then, then if you can overcome the technical hurdles of just doing it like in your, you know, in your private basement, uh, now try to actually deploy that in the face of the compatibility constraints you're up against. And it's, it's basically just sails right over uh, like whoever has like the, that's what I said earlier, like there's nobody with the combination of patience and skill to do certain things. Um, Well, that's, that's the thing. It's like any new capability is inc incredibly juicy because it, there's nothing, like, it's new. So there's nothing that has to be dragged along with it. Well, there's always invoke dynamics, <laughs> which for you is invoke static at runtime. It basically lets you rewrite all your, we, we talked about this, all, I, all your limited and, and, and we're very ambitious uh, for what, what we can squeeze out of that. Um, yeah, but it's like I think it would require like a comprehensive uh, utilization to overcome some of you know what we face now with just some of this there's just you th that type just can't exist in our world what so will you synthesize an annotation uh, It doesn't. It sounds like a huge improvement to me. What? It sounds. It's not impossible. Like it's the. But the work is is not like the good kind of work. It's the oh god kind of work. But it's. I mean, like that's a very appealing idea. At uh, yeah, it's a very appealing idea. They are. That's that's. Yeah. That that's much of the problem. Like the. For instance, like one of one of my lost days in the preparing for this talk was in working out why you can't call get simple name on a nested Scala object without malformed name. And so, after chasing it all down and working it out in, in grandiose detail, it's like I know exactly what we're doing wrong, and I think we can't fix it at least not trivially because it would make it slightly more difficult to access Scala from Java. So you know they'd have to type another dollar sign. It's, you know that's. And you just never know, like you know, how these things play out. But it's, it is. I wish we had like hard data on how often people really use Scala from Java because I. I is it? I, sometimes I just wait. Well, that's good news in some sense because I wake up screaming, thinking that nobody's even trying to do this, and we're doing all this suffering for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they do, they do, but they're right, like they actually write separate Java classes to make it good because, if, because even though it kind of works, you know, Java to Scala, it's still really ugly and it's not going to be pleasant. 
right? If you really want it to be pleasant, you got to write you got to write a layer in Java, and that does. And you also need to do that for correctness purposes, just because of the impedance mismatches. Uh, and I I really think that should just be more of a like first thing to do rather than like let's just hope it works out of the box because it doesn't. I mean, it's just not good enough. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely not right. Right. Yeah. It's like th there's things like variants are just you know the, the the nightmare continues right because without without meaningful definition site variants in Java, uh, then you know we're always kind of at odds with like what's you know what's a valid thing to do. Oh. I <laughs> R right, right. Yeah. So th this would this would be like uh, declaring, you know, the the signature of like the job, what the Java thing looks like in Java. Is it like I, it's been a while since I programmed C. I mean, I, I past life. Remind me what extern C exactly is entailing. Ah. Yeah, boy. The the mangling. We'll come back to mangling. I, I've seen those J and I method names. They don't look good. <laughs> well, but it's kind of sick, right? Why are we encoding so much information in the names of things, right? Like if there's, if there's metadata that's associated with it in an understood way, then you don't have to, we, we shouldn't have to live in this world of dollar signs all the time, right? I mean, that's we should obscure that. When you only have one channel of information and it's the name, things go bad. Okay, so what's a different name then? Because, you know, like, let's look at, see if I can, maybe I'll have to go out of order a little. Let's go, uh, oh, well, that's, so I forgot about that, because, you know, I'm like learning, and, and, and while burning off a week on this, I learned how to do all this cool stuff. I was gonna, I was gonna take you to the trade example where we could talk about what a different name is, but uh, since I can't, so I don't know how to navigate this well enough. Um, oh, by the way, anybody know who that is? Or the quote? This will this will be one of the hard ones. Well, I looked it up. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Wittgenstein. I, not, not that I'm German or anything, but yes, yes, a great a, a great thinker. All right, so uh, let's go a little further, and we will get to some good examples of like mangling issues, and we could talk about it in that context. Um, so uh, we had the unification business earlier, uh, but of course, you know, sometimes you unify, and then sometimes you diversify. Uh, so, a bunch of access levels, I've already harped on that. Um, multiple inheritance, uh, yeah, like it's great, it's terrible. Uh, it's great and it's terrible, both true. Um, and if your language is lacking XML literals, you know where to come, that's us. <laughs> um, and then there's evaluation semantics where there's quite sort of a, uh, a hodgepodge of different ways of not being eager. Um, it's that, that sort of tries to make it look worse than it is because it's not really that bad, um, all things considered. Uh, but it's, you know, like each of those has its own set of distinct uh, semantics and uh, problems. And it's, you know, there's a bunch of like stuff you end up juggling in your head to manage all that. And then of course, variance. All right, all right, let's talk about equality because this is what I like, this was the sick thing that we did. This is like, boy. The, it seemed like such a little thing at the time. We'll just unify the boxes with the primitives and there'll be one thing and you won't have to think about all of that stuff. So that happened before my time and so then like everything, everything else is me just sort of trying to sort it out. So first of all, we have our own method. It's where, you know, you guys have a double equals but since you, that's almost never what you want, reference equality, and that's a lot shorter than dot equals open paren, right? We use double equals to mean call equals. Great. Well, it almost means that. It means if left side is null, then don't do that. Just see if the other side is null. Otherwise, call equals. So this is good, right? This shows you can't do it naively. But then the primitive business came along, and now that means that if you want to compare one and one L, 
Well, maybe that's true and maybe it's not because you better not let that get to an equals call because then it's false. Uh, so it becomes dependent on the static type. You do not want your equality comparisons to depend on the static types of the argument. That's bad news. So here we are being smart about it. And now you see the serializable, always our friend. So, and it's a very similar sort of context here. The, the, the reason this plays out the way that it does uh, is we had to recognize every single way something might be a box comparison so that we could get in there before it got to equals. <laughs> so don't miss one, as was done here, or you get this. And now we can, now we can see these spilled coffee. So I did get the earlier slide with the coffee and the lip, right? Many a, a slip or a C, it's like, as you know, madness, because that make, won't, won't make any sense uh, without that. But that's the idea, is that you have just spilled your coffee on the way, that's, that's the slip. That's the slip. That's a really good comment. That's not what he said at the time. But uh, <laughs> it, ought, it, it is really true. I, I'd, be, I'd be really impressed when he recognizes him, even though he's very famous. I, I, you know, all these guys with their wigs look the same. It's John Adams. So of course, if there's a big problem with equals, we get to solve it and be halfway done. Can anybody guess what the value of one equals <laughs> 107 million is. False. <laughs> Odds makers take a beating. <laughs> so, and now, now this is where you really start to question yourself, like, what am I doing? Because you shouldn't be using integers, boxes as hash keys anyway. So why is it really a big deal if, you know, the hash codes aren't equal? But, you know, it's like we've gone down this road, we're getting sucked down this road, we can't get back. Tendrils, original sin. Pick your metaphor. Don't let the first step be taken if you don't want to take about a thousand more. So it's even worse here than it was because we already had indirection with equals. So it seemed like, oh, well, we've already got indirection. We'll just do a little more indirection. Now we have to invent a method and then make people use it, right? Because if you call hash code, it's too late. You've already called hash code. So we invented a method and we named it hash hash, see? <laughs> That was my, my brilliant innovation. I apologize. <laughs> I, would have been, I would have been better to just delete the code base and then to continue down this road. But I feel like JavaScript's tougher now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> is that your plan to delete the code base? Or, or uh, <laughs> I don't know if that was a reference to hash hash or just the yeah. futility of it all. But both are equally valid. <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, more and more it becomes apparent to me that, like, because we, the, I, you know, there could be 10 presentations of this length just about array wrapping in Scala before we gave up. And after we gave up, like, you know, the birds started singing again. Everything was different because we didn't even try anymore. It's like, look, it's an array. Just deal. We should do that with everything. Be great. So, uh, like, the more performance-minded among you might be thinking, is he serious? Like, if I, like, have a list of, a, you know, 10,000 Ts, which we don't know what it is, so it's going to look like any ref, and I go looking for, you know, an any ref in there or another T, is it really going to just do this huge, like, is this an instance of a number? Is this? Yes, it is. <laughs> this, is your, this is your evidence right here. That's where it's going. That's, that's a, that wouldn't fit on the slide, but it's a lot of, like, and, and very conveniently, thank you, Oracle, character is all by itself. Not, and so you've got to do two instance tests. It's not a number. It's a character. But characters, of course, in primitive land act just like numbers. So you know, double the, double the trillions of, of useless instance tests that we do every day. Um, be be nice, to, nice to get some help with that one, some kind of common parent there. Of course, you know, if we're going to, yeah, it's like that's not, that's not the first piece of help that we need, clearly. Uh, uh, is it like, is this a character or an integer? Uh, oh, it is. Well, it is like that box's runtime there was, that's a library function of, of ours. Oh, you mean is there, a, is there a JDK library function that does it? Yeah, that's what, the, oh, well, I deleted some, for brevity reasons, I deleted some of it. But the, the thing where it said boxes runtime.equals, that is, that's a static method call. That's passing the two guys in. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Good. Good is not really an applicable word here, but I, got, I took your drift. Um, you know, that guy. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Him. And there are no slides whatsoever that this quote has any bearing on in this one. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't it be nice if there were? <laughs> I just like the sentiment and how ahead of his time he was. <laughs> ah, here we can talk about mangling. So, private this for extra emphasis, okay? This is an an immutable vow. It's going to be said exactly once and nothing in the entire universe is allowed to read it. It may as well be a tree falling in a forest. And yet, that's what we get when we compile it along with its buddy here. This is the implementation class. This is the trait constructor, which takes an argument of a B, that being the interface, and then calls the setter. The setter, it's an immutable value. Well, we have to set it, though, in the first place. And we have no way to do that with separate compilation. And even JDK 8 with its defender methods, or I guess you don't call them that anymore, but that's still a cooler name. Sorry that that's not what they're called. Uh, won't, you know, we, we can't be helped because without state, you know, we can't solve our problems. Or at least, you know, this, so this is where everything winds up, and it's, it's madness. Look at what you're looking at, right? This is, this is X inherited nothing. <laughs> or should have inherited nothing uh, because it's invisible to it, and yet you have all this stuff and it's part of the API. This is, here's a little walkthrough in case uh, you ever want to, you know, walk the path that X has walked so you can feel like X. Inherit a private field that is invisible to you from a trait, which is never read by anything in the place where it is visible and certainly not read by you. Now you can when you're instantiated, throw yourself at the impl class so that it can take you and call the setter that you have exposed for the purpose of setting that private field, which you can't see or use in any way. Then you get yourself back, and, and of course, there, that's the name of it, right? B dollar dollar M. Um, and then, so that's when the fun really begins because you could have 10 parents, each of which has like a guy called M in it, and so that's where this mangling comes from. Yes? Why does Scala say you can inherit a private number? It, it's, well, you, the specification says you can't. You can see, you should just, if you're really interested, you can always go to the issue database and see why nobody wants me to speak for them. <laughs> does, does this mean that adding a new private number to the super type is a binary incompatible option? Absolutely it is, yes. That's, that, is, that is the entire thrust of, of, of this thing right here. That's, that private this val m is as immutable and private as it's possible to be, and yet its name is encoded as b dollar dollar m in the API of class x. But we'll see, we have the, the compiler is just detected as if not inheriting anything, then what's the point of adding all those methods? Well, in, well you're, you're right that in this example, it could say nothing ever uses that. Let's see, lied it, but this is clearly rigged a little bit, right? Like to make it look particularly bad. Real life examples, it probably is used by something privately, locally, and then the problem will persist. And then, you know, even, even like there are various subsets of the problem that you can improve on, but when you look at what you can do in Scala with self types, and just there's all these ways where it's, it's quite possible that the code itself is deeply divorced from the place where it's operating. So access is just really hard to pull off without everything being public, and then boom. So, hmm. There are days, there are days, Avian looks very, you know, it's like I love, you know, Oracle, I love Java, but Avian looks kind of interesting just because I can modify it, and it's like it's hard to modify Hotspot, or at least it has been historically. It's clearly the trend lines are in a very good direction. Well, can Scala survive with this interoperability? I mean, is this going to pull it down for them? I, I'm not the guy to ask because I'm a, like feel opposite of everybody else. Like, at every point in my life, I've felt like the total like, number of users of Scala is tiny compared to what it could be, and I'm ready to just break everything and do it better. Yeah. And like, that's, that's, I've thought that in 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, and 13. 
still think it. <laughs> um, but that's me, and I, I, I don't agree with everybody else. And for the most part, other people are like, you know, opposite extreme, or at least in the middle. But so, if you did that, would the JV, mapping into the JVM, would you? Would you well, I would, I, I'd have to tackle the language too, right? So you gotta go after like the, the, the ideas that have worked out the worst in practice in terms of how they map to the implementation. But I would let the implementation inform the magic new language, yeah, I mean, like very much so. Um, The Maybe not uh, all the language detail would be interesting to be used from, from Java. Oh well, the good news is, you know, there's plenty of like there's plenty of stuff that just doesn't work, and so like even though that subset is not like defined, it's implied by the stuff that you can't do. Right? Try and instantiate like a trait from Java, and you'll really have a good time going on. Yeah, but especially it was like I, the ideal language from my point of view is a completely seamless, beautiful process of using Java from Scala. And the other direction I find to be of low importance at best. I would just I would do things differently if that was what I wanted because you would never get a really satisfying solution out of that. Uh, you could write a little Java code; it won't kill you. You know, like write a little Java code and make yourself a nice glue layer. But don't just expect you know this this it's a big truck and a little cup. I don't know. Um, there were, I saw a couple other hands. So, question then, this slide kind of answers my question, but the, given the binary compatibility problem out there, why don't you think it's more reliable to stop based on having this big thing? Right, that breaks, that breaks every, everybody that mixes that in. Well, that's the thing. It's like we have to punt on separate compilation. These, these, these sort of larger decisions are out of my hands. I just work here. <laughs> um, the, like somebody has to say, well, separate compilation is not important enough uh, to do that. And right, there's only one somebody who can make those decisions. Um, so, yeah, right. I mean, you you definitely a whole raft of new problems would come with that. Like, but because of this, uh, like, I think that's a. I'm 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 ready to to throw that baby into the water. Well, we've got this workshop after this. Uh -huh. Why don't you keep all questions for that? Oh, okay, sure. Okay, great. As, yeah, sorry. How much? What is it? Have I like? Do I have any time? Or really? <laughs> That's terrible. Why did somebody tell me? I I had no idea. Okay, well, wait. The, I, I've at least like. Oh, you know what? That's so. I I must have done stuff out of order. Come on, this is funny. Tell me it's funny. <laughs> this is actually my last slide. So uh, I I feel like I must have squished some slides out somewhere. But I'm if I'm way, I have I never know what time it is. Sorry about that. But anyway, uh, yes. We can keep going for another hour because we have another session. So let's do that. But I'm, I guess I'm done with the prepared remarks. <laughs>